Paula and delegates, first of all, um, an enormous thank you for the recognition uh, and the honour of this award. Uh, I have to tell you that about the time of the Queen's Birthday Honours, that the Queen's Birthday Honours were announced, my son said, uh, when are you getting your honour, Dad? And it wasn't the conventional family quip they left you off the list. Uh, because, uh, because he knew this particular one was in train, and, and he was comparing the two. Sam had, in fact, inadvertently landed on a significant social truth. We in the union movement are incredibly good at celebrating our defeats and abysmal in acknowledging contribution and success. I salute the PSA for continuing its tradition of honouring our own, and I'm immensely glad that you think that I deserve that recognition. I joined the staff at the end of 1976, as Paula said. Uh, it had a general and a deputy general secretary, and three divisions, administration, industrial, and research. They reflected the workplace of the time and the way the pay and conditions were set. The Public Sector Act was passed in 1912. It established a regime of public administration that was uh, being introduced around the world at that time. It's absolutely no coincidence that the PSA was established one year later and that it mirrored the worker interests in what academics called the bureaucratic paradigm. That public administrative structure introduced in Public Service Act 1912 was remarkably durable and flexible. It survived two world wars, the Great Depression, and the longest period of economic expansion in the history of the world. The system entrenched a unified career public service. The expectation was that public servants entered for an expected 40 years of service, applied for any vacancy that offered promotion, moved across departments and around the country and exited with a healthy GSF pension. Single women on the permanent staff were given a block of four weeks leave when they married. Um, it was to compensate for the trauma of the wedding night. <laughs> Uh, in, in, in truth, not so. Uh, when they married, they were no longer entitled to remain as permanent public servants. They became temporaries. Marriage leave was to compensate for the loss of accrued entitlements of permanent staff status, like uh, long service and retirement leave. Married women had long since been able to continue on the permanent staff by 1976, but the entitlement remained. After all, rights won through militant class struggle were not to be surrendered lightly. <laughs> In reality, uh, marriage leave, like so much else, was simply a reflection of not only a career public service, but of a male breadwinner career public service. Uh, I recall that when Stan Roger went into Parliament, I was the senior research officer and next in line for the Assistant General Secretary's job. When I didn't apply for the job, Andy Bell, an old stalwart who was Assistant General Secretary in charge of administration, asked me, are you an itinerant? Such was the day. As I've said, the PSA structure mirrored the reality of the public service. The Research and Publicity Division handled the advocacy for worker-friendly pay-fixing laws. It did the background work for public service-wide pay adjustments and it made input into the Federation of Labour and Combined State Unions general wage order applications. Uh, it was next to the General Secretary on the fifth floor. The Industrial Division, they used to call it Arbitration Division because it was an arbitrated system of pay fixing, um, handled the advocacy of occupational group claims and appeals, the equivalent of personal grievances of today. It was alongside the Deputy General Secretary and on the Fourth floor. The administration division did the bread and butter stuff like membership but kept the organisation alive. It was on the third floor. All wonderfully hierarchical. A network of regional officers housed the organisers who recruited and turned out the members on campaigns. 
A place for everyone and everyone in their place. <laughs> the PSA pursued what the communists of the day would have described as a two-line struggle. We mobilised and lobbied to make sure that the rules that determine pay and conditions were friendly, and then we aligned the union structures and activities to take best advantage of them. It was a very active membership, involved in regular workplace and mass meetings, rallies, marches, letter writing campaigns, and so on. What was different then was that all members had an interest in the pay fixing rules, so there was a common bond and a common cause that allowed unity of action. The annual conference was an important part of maintain, maintaining a nationwide unity of purpose and a national network. And I'm really pleased to see that the conference has continuing now to perform that networking and bonding function um, because it did, was uh, in abeyance for a while. We didn't rely on compulsory union membership or exclusive legal rights to bargain on behalf of classes of workers as was the case in the private sector. But governments then, and workers, both had an interest in dealing with one union and one employer in the state sector. So there was in practice a concept of recognition. One union was recognised as the legitimate representative for different categories of state employees. Public service, education, rail, postal, health, etc. This Reconciliation of differences through agreed structures and processes didn't always go well. We had two occasions when the government threatened to withdraw the recognition of the PSA. The trouble was that it threatened to withdraw that by statute, not by administrative action. And not only did the draft law threaten to de-recognise the PSA, but it didn't recognise us enough to also threaten to seize our assets. I suppose the logic was that if the PSA didn't have any role anymore, it didn't need to have any resources to carry out a role. Those confrontations had a habit of escalating, at least rhetorically. But one of them went to the brink. The Prime Minister threatened to, to declare a state of emergency, along with all of the accompanying powers of detention without trial and the like. His excuse was that no government could stand by while the union threatened to disconnect the electricity supply to the country. I know I sound like a wussy class collaborationist, but he was probably right. <laughs> the only problem was that the PSA never actually threatened to do that. As it transpired, Jim Knox of the Federation of Labour and Ron Burgess, who chaired the combined state unions, met Maldon at the 11th hour and broke the deal, so the PSA lived on. Despite everything, I don't think Muldoon actually wanted a final confrontation. I've since read his memoirs, and he did see a role for unions in the political economy, something that Jim alluded to uh, in, in his contribution. Muldoon notes that a number of National Party supporters always urged him to escalate political confrontation with unions because the politics of that worked in their favour. He says, and I'm quoting him, the elected government of the day will always finally win such a confrontation. But the damage that will be done will be so great as to make the decision to face up to a confrontation one which will be taken on very rare occasions. These were heady days, but I suppose we had it easy compared with where you are today. The bureaucratic paradigm of public administration collapsed in a perfect storm when the combination of technological, social, economic, and political forces made it obsolete. The fragmentation of public administration has broken the common interest of public sector workers. And you've had to protect the common bond of unionization uh, in an extremely resource-intensive organizing environment. It's to the credit of honorary and paid PSA officials that the union stands strong and proud as you approach your centennial year. Thank you again for the honour and my best wishes for you all, or now, more correctly, our next 100 years. Here comes. <laughs>